Good morning, church. It is a snowy Sunday morning over here, cold, but we've got a nice fire running. I hope everything is going well for you guys over there, that you're staying safe and that you're staying well. Uh, the kids and I were talking just yesterday about how we miss going to church. Not often, or not always, missing the driving, but we sure miss the destination. Um, we talked about missing donuts and actually going to Bible class and them having teachers other than um, <clears throat> me, eager to, get, eager to get away from just me. And uh, we talked about all of the stories that Jerry would tell during announcements and at other times and singing songs. Jerry leaving the fourth verse of songs to me. Um, just seeing your faces. We do miss you guys and we look forward to being able to see you again. But uh, for all the things that we praised our church family for yesterday, I'm always mindful that one of the other things that I can praise my church family for is that through this time we uh, have been a church family, you have been a church family at every turn dedicated to loving one another and loving our neighbors as best we can through this and it's not easy and it's been a sacrifice and we miss one another um, but you are doing Christ likeness as best you know how and so you should be praised for that. But now we're going to go ahead and turn back to the Gospel of Mark. This is one of the reasons why we walk through the life of Jesus every year, because we're supposed to be following Jesus. You're, I want to say, exhibiting fruit of that, and so I want to thank you for that and praise you for that, and you are a blessing in our life. And so we continue with the practice, because that is uh, one of the things that helped form us in this way. And so we're in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, we're kind of at this in-between time in the storytelling between the major events, say, of his birth, and we're kind of at the beginning of his ministry, and um, we're not quite to the, the stuff at the end with the controversy and the cross yet. And so we're talking about uh, Jesus and the story of Jesus in a broader sort of way. And what I want to do today is, just for a few minutes, I want to look at two texts um, that illustrate something I mentioned a few times last week as we were talking about the opening verses of the Gospel of Mark. And that is that um, what Mark does in his Gospel, and what I want you to pay attention to as we go through the Gospel of Mark this year, these next few months, is that Mark kind of subverts, he kind of flips upside down our expectations of the way things work. And so uh, the way that Mark does this primarily is that he loves to locate faith in uh, characters in the story that in their time and their culture and their place one would never expect them to have faith. He's finding faith in all of the wrong places and those who you would expect to have faith, those who consider themselves faithful, those who consider themselves the people of God, those who consider themselves on the inside in Mark's gospel, they are the ones who um, are hard-hearted or are um, problematic or faithless, who actually stand against Jesus at times. And that is clear um, in, in, in the greatest part of the disciples. The disciples are the ones in Mark that stand as the most faithless, the ones who are the most problematic, who stand against Jesus in some of the most crucial moments. And so what Mark does, um, finding faith in all of the wrong places, and uh, exhibiting faith, or exhibiting a lack of faith rather in all of the right places, is he flips it all on its head, and what he does is he challenges those of us who um, go to worship every Sunday, or you know, right now we tune into a live stream, call into a bridge call to worship together as best we can every Sunday, who read our Bibles every day, who pray every day, who are obviously religious. He challenges us to stop and think. He gives us this invitation to stop and think. Are we really following Jesus the way that we assume that we are following Jesus? Because Mark makes open this possibility that those who believe that they are on the inside, those who believe that they are faithful, those who believe that they've gotten it right really haven't gotten it right. And so there are these times in Mark's gospel where um, Jesus is actually having to work around the ones who are supposed to be helping him. The ones who have been looking for him, the ones who have been praying with him, or praying for him uh, and his arrival. So what we want to do is we want to let Mark do his work in us. We want to let Mark do his question. We are 
the ones who get together and we log in on Sunday morning and we would show up for worship on Sunday morning and uh, we are the ones who'd sing the songs and pray the prayers and we would read our Bibles. We we do the Christian things. And so since our goal is to actually follow Jesus, we don't want to just assume that we are um, the right people, that we've got it, that we're on the inside. We want to let Mark do his work and ask the hard question. Humbly and sincerely, do we understand Jesus as well as we think we do? It's kind of what Mark is driving at in his gospel. He's written this gospel to Christians. He's not explaining what Christianity is, but he's talking to a group of people who already claim to be Christians. And so um, with all that in mind, I want to give you two examples of how that looks in Mark's gospel. And I want to give you a homework assignment too. I'll go ahead and hit you with it up front. Um, I did this this week. It took about an hour and a half because I'm a slow reader, but you're a fast reader and you'll go faster than me. Um, sit down this week and just read Mark's gospel all the way through. It's only 16 chapters, the shortest of the gospels, about half as long as the other ones. Um, read Mark's gospel half or all the way through in one sitting. I mean, get up, take a bathroom break if you need to do that, but just, just read it all at once. And as you do, pay particular attention to how different characters in the story relate to Jesus and what it is that through the that storytelling, through those relatings, what is Mark trying to tell us? What is Mark challenging us with? And then ask yourself, how does Mark treat the reader? How does he relate to us? What sorts of assumptions does he make about us? And so I want you to do that this week. Uh, report back in if you want to. Let me know how it goes. Uh, as I've been saying, I I'm not on social media a whole lot. I am a little more than I used to be. Uh, but you can drop me a message or, or post on my page or um, leave a comment somewhere or you can text me. Whatever you want to do, just let, let me know how it goes. Read gospel, the Gospel of Mark all at once. But the first text I want to look at is at the end of Mark chapter 4 going into Mark chapter 5. At the end of Mark chapter 4, this is when Jesus calms the storm at sea. And so you'll remember that story well if you've grown up in church. This is after a long, hard day of teaching, and they've gone out in a boat after that. They're crossing over the sea, and uh, Jesus is asleep in the, um, the front of the boat, and there's this strong storm that comes up, and the apostles, many of them who were fishermen, who were accustomed to the sea, kind of knew what was what. They're afraid for their life. They're convinced that they are going to die. And uh, so they go and wake Jesus up, who's sleeping through the whole thing. And uh, they say, aren't you, uh, don't you care that we're going to die? So Jesus gets up and he calms the storm. This uh, tremendous display of power displays power not only over uh, demons. We've seen that, and we're going to see that again in a minute. Not only over, over um, diseases and illnesses, but over the storms of the sea. That's a, a big claim. Well, that story... Um, ends in verse 41 of Mark chapter 4 with this statement. It says, Overcome with all, they, the apostles, said to each other, Who is this then? Even the wind and the sea obey him. Now by this point, they've been with Jesus for quite a while. Uh, they're starting to, to see some things, to experience some things. They've seen the power of Jesus before. They kind of know what is going on. But Mark ends this story with a question, Who is this? As if the disciples, after all of the time they've spent with him so far, they're still kind of wondering who Jesus is. They still haven't got it. These are the ones who spend day in and day out with him, but they haven't got it. And it goes immediately from there to where they land on the other side of the sea. And they land in the region of the Gerasenes, which were not Jewish people. These are not the people of God. And one of the first clues that you get is where they land, there is a herd of pigs. And that's, of course, a no-no if you're a Jew. So they land in the region of the Gerasenes and they get out of the boat and there amongst all of these pigs that we're about to discover is this man who is possessed with a demon. And uh, the demon, immediately as Jesus comes up to him, begins to shout, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. And I want you to see what's going on here. Mark's doing unexpected things. He's flipping our expectations, our assumptions on its head. At the end of the calming of the sea story, the disciples, those who are with Jesus, they ask, who is this? 
at the beginning of chapter 5, the demons, legion, inside of this demonic man in Gentile territory amongst a herd of pigs says, you are the son of the Most High God. And the point and the contrast that Mark seems to be making is the disciples who spent all of their time with Jesus, who had seen his displays of power, who had heard his teaching, who had experienced what it was like to follow him and share in his life, they still didn't get it. But even this demon gets it, but the story isn't done. Jesus cast out the demons as the story goes along. He casts them into this herd of swine. Um, <clears throat> down in verse 11, sorry, just trying to, to breathe and look for my uh, passage all at the same time. And this man now um, free of the demons comes to Jesus and he says, I want to follow you. This man demonstrates at least the same faith, if not greater faith than what the disciples have done. He comes to him, I want to follow you, not a Jew. A man who up until very recently would have been a social outcast. They kept him in chains. They kept him out in the countryside away from everybody else because he was such a violent person. Not the sort of person you want on your team. Not the sort of person you would expect to have faith. But he's the one who comes to Jesus. I want to follow you. And Jesus tells him to go spread the news about what had happened to him amongst his hometown. So we have this man who goes to his hometown and he spreads the word of Jesus, the good news, the gospel of what Jesus is doing in the world amongst this non-Jewish community where they have herds of pigs roaming about. And so here we have a story, two stories, a contrast. The disciples, they demonstrate, or they see demonstrated the power of Jesus after having been with him for a while. And they say, who is this man? And then you have the demon who confesses who Jesus is. He, he gets it in that sense while they don't. And then you have faithfulness in the most unexpected of places. This garrison demonic recently healed becomes one of the first evangelists uh, in his area. He, Jesus finds faith in an unexpected person in an unexpected place. And um, if you were in the early church and the, the apostles were your heroes, this is not the way the story is supposed to go. This is not the way it's supposed to work. They were the ones who got it. They were the ones who were right. They were the ones who were on the inside. Who is this garrison guy? Um, and so it stops and begs the question. When we assume that we've got it, that we are in, uh, do we actually have reason to repent? Do we actually have reason to dig in deeper to who Jesus is? Do we actually have reason to re-explore some of the things that we have assumed and held just to be true because that's the way we've done it and our parents have done it. This is the way we've understood the Bible for generations. Do you really get it? The second story that I want to talk about just for a little while this morning starts in verse 14 of the Gospel of Mark, or chapter 14, rather, of the Gospel of Mark. This was two days before the Passover feast, and this is, of course, right before Jesus was going to be um, uh, arrested and tried and executed. And uh, they are in Bethany, and they are at Simon's house, and there is this dinner going on, and this woman comes in, and in this beautiful gesture, she takes this expensive bottle of ointment. I mean, an extraordinarily expensive bottle of ointment. And she breaks it open. She pours it over Jesus' head. She, she anoints Jesus. Jesus is preparing him for his burial. This woman in a culture where women were often not afforded the same status as men, demonstrates this great act of love, this great act of beauty, this great act of faith. And of course, the disciples, you will remember the story, they object to it. Here she is wasting this ointment when we could have sold it and we could have used it for our ministry. And Jesus, as he often does in the Gospel of Mark, more often than not, he rebukes them. You guys don't understand what is going on, he says. And so then from there, just kind of leave that hanging in your mind for a minute. From there, they, they go and they enjoy the Passover meal. Uh, it is at the Passover meal that Jesus um, not only says that someone is going to uh, betray him, but he also reminds Peter that he is going to betray him, to abandon him as well. They go from there to the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's in the Garden of Gethsemane after this woman has, um, two days previous after this woman has 
uh, demonstrated her faithfulness in this profoundly beautiful way, and the disciples haven't got it, and Jesus has to explain it. After the Passover meal where uh, someone is going to betray me, and Peter is going to deny me, they go to Gethsemane, and the disciples um, persistently, repeatedly fall asleep while Jesus asks them to pray with him. And then Jesus is arrested. And Jesus is down in verse 53, brought to the Sanhedrin, kind of the religious authorities of the day, and, and he's put on trial. And here I want you to see something striking. This stood out in a way that it uh, has never stood out to me before as I was reading through Mark earlier this week. Um, as Jesus is on trial among the Sanhedrin, one of the ways they get him is they bring in people to bear false witness against him. They bring in cooked up witnesses to say things about Jesus and what Jesus has taught that Jesus never said and taught. They bear false witness against Jesus and he is convicted in part on the basis of what those false witnesses said. But meanwhile, down in verse 66, Peter's outside the Sanhedrin meeting. He's warming his hands around a fire and this is where someone comes up to him and says, oh, you are with Jesus, aren't you? You're one of his people and, and Peter denies it. And three times Peter denies it. And it struck me as I was reading that this week that uh, as the Sanhedrin is bringing false witness against Jesus on the inside, Peter is on the outside bringing false witness against Jesus. They're doing it in slightly different ways, but they're doing the same thing. The um, rock, the one who made the confession, you are the son of God in that moment of glory, the one who was allowed to, to come up on the Mount of Transfiguration and, and witness that, the, the one that Jesus would love enough to come in, in John's gospel, just to jump out for a second, to, to come and restore him to faithfulness after everything was said and done. Peter, like the apostle's apostle, he's doing the same thing the Sanhedrin does. They're the ones on the outside. They are the bad guys. He's the one on the inside. He is the faithful one. No matter what happens, he said back at the last meal, I will never deny or desert or leave you. I'm with you till the end. And he ends up doing the same thing that the Sanhedrin is doing. As a matter of fact, Peter is actually not alone in that. Um, everyone at the time of Jesus' arrest deserts him and runs away from him. And I want, you, I want you to hear that. We have this set of stories that starts with this woman and her display of great faithfulness, this anointing of Jesus with expensive oil. We have um, Passover, you're going to betray me. I will never betray you. We have them falling asleep in the garden. We have them deserting Jesus. We have Peter bearing false witness against Jesus at the same time that Sanhedrin is bearing false witness against Jesus. But then we come down to verse um, 40 of Mark chapter 15. And this is as Jesus dies. And this is, by the way, just before that, um, when those who stood facing Jesus, not his disciples, they, they had for the most part in Mark's gospel deserted him. They're nowhere to be found. But those who stood facing Jesus as he died said, this man was certainly God's son. The demons confess it. His enemies confess it. And then in verse 40, some women were watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger one, and Joseph and Salome. And when Jesus was in Galilee, these women had followed and supported him along with many other women who had come to Jerusalem with him. That's how the crucifixion story ends. And so... Um, powerfully told story. It begins with a, this woman, um, sort of person who was second class in society. Faith coming from a woman such as that would be an unexpected thing and the apostles object to it as she anoints Jesus' head and he has to explain to them what she is doing. It was we go through that the apostles betray Jesus and desert Jesus and bear false witness against Jesus. Those who had been with him from the beginning and at the end when he dies, the, the only ones confessing he is the son of God are those who are his enemies, who are onlookers, who are watching, who had been deriding him. And uh, just after that, the only ones who stuck with him through the entire thing are these women. And Mark makes a point of, of pointing out, mentioning that they had been with him from the beginning. 
just like the guys who deserted him had, just like the guys who bore false witness against him had, just like the guys who had betrayed him had. The women in their culture, that would have been a shocking and a surprising thing. Faithfulness comes from unexpected places. And so the question, again, Mark finding faith in all the wrong places, and, and he's finding faithlessness in all of the places that you would expect it. For those of us who just assume, of course we're the faithful. Of course we're on the inside. Of course we get it. We're Christians. I mean, look at us. Uh, Mark begs this question, do you really get it? Do you really get Jesus? Are you really following him? Because it's easy to say it. It's harder to live it. And so um, I want us to wrestle with that. Not because I think we're doing a bad job at it necessarily, but because it's a part of this healthy process for us to wrestle with this and to ask this question like occasionally, to let Mark do his work and to let the Spirit do its work or his work through what Mark is doing and come closer to Jesus as we do it. All right. I want to pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Then we'll remember who we are, and uh, we'll turn you loose on the world as best you can. And this is going to be a week uh, with a lot of controversy, with a lot of noise, with a lot of stuff going on. We really need Jesus' people in our communities this week, and I have the, the greatest faith that uh, in Fairview, the greater Fairview area, including that little town of Nashville up the road where some of you have to go, um, you will represent Jesus well and be peacemakers and ministers of reconciliation. So let's pray. Lord, help us see Jesus. Clear out everything that stands between us and him. The most cherished traditions, the most firmly held views of how the world works. If it obscures Jesus, tear it away from us. We want to be Jesus people, nothing else. Give us the courage, give us the faith to be that. And we come and we pray as a family. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours the king, power and the kingdom and the glory now and forever. Amen. Let's remember who we are as we go into God's world. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbors as ourselves. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God, whom you have never seen, if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, have a good week. We love you. We miss you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.